uh, I'm going to like introduce the, this kind of mod advanced monocolor method, the randomized one, non randomized one, in the context of the Bayesian inference problem. And first, I'm going to talk about the inference problem that I'm um, considered here. Uh, we established those inverse problem by linking the observations to, to, or the data y with the parameter x with a form model, we call it g here. This form model could be the, like the PD equations or the neural networks or like some stochastic process or Hadamard model, something like that. It's just a general uh form for the inverse problem and also we add uh, observations terms here to represent the model much more accurate since when you got like the data from the real world problem or establish the model there are often some uh errors occurs here we're using like the bayesian modeling on this inverse problem to uh learn and infer the parameter that we uh, want is the parameter x here. And compare with the frequentist like modeling, like the maximum likelihood estimation, it only will give you a fixed value, a fixed, it will see this parameter x as the fixed value and to infer it. But for the Bayesian modeling, instead of just giving a fixed point value, it will give you the whole posterior distribution of this parameter. And uh, based on this posterior distribution, you can like learning many things from that, like the mean, the variance, or uh, giving any quantity of interest, you can learn about the mean and variance or any moment of this quantity of interest, phi x. So the, the method that we will introduce here is to estimate the expectation of the quantity of interest under this kind of posterior distribution. However, it's worth noting that the posterior distribution that computed in this Bayesian inference problems often cannot be computed analytically and can only be computed up to a constant of proportionality. And in particular, since the most of the computational algorithm will just consider the case that's in designed on a finite resolution, although the nature of this problem is infinite, but you can only compute it at a finite resolution. So we also compute consider the posterior distribution only can be approximated at a finite resolution. In this context, uh, when estimating the expectation is not that straightforward and easy. The, there are two key questions that we need to answer here. Is first one is that how do we sample from this approximated unnormalized posterior distribution? The second one is that when we estimating the expectation, the normal way, naive way is to use thing the Monte Carlo method. However, when the dimension goes high and in this approximated version, is the Monte Carlo method still be efficient enough? This is the two questions we're going to solve through this talk. First, I'm talking about the suitable sampler that can allow us to sample from this kind of posterior distribution. The first one is the uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo sampler. The MCMC sampler is a well-known and widely used method. And this MCMC sampler designed a Markov chain with a sequence of uh, outputs which distributed according to the target distribution. However, this method, uh, many, of, many of the type of in this method, like the MALA method, the random uh, walk matriplic hasty method, well degenerated as dimension goes high. And also this kind of method cannot be deal with the multimodal distribution. However, here we use uh, another samplers called the sequential Monte Carlo samplers. This samplers, the setup of this sampler is a little bit harder than the MCMC, but this sampler is much more efficient than the MCMC and can deal with the multimodal distribution. Um, moreover, in practical use, they have pretty good in uh, interesting that it seems uh, one can like introduce the parallel computing in the SMC sampler straightforwardly and naturally. As we like said before, that's the because of there is a only we can approximate the posterior distribution at finite resolution. That may be because there are some discretizations of the bias or the parameter x. Such as uh, when you're like computing the PD problem, you can just 
approximated as the finite uh, grid mesh not in the infinite version or in the neural net method, you can just come consider the uh, finite number of the neurons or finite number of the layers. So that will bring an extra discretization bias term when you compute the complexity of the Monte Carlo method. So people are in, uh, develop some advanced Monte Carlo method like the multi level and the multi index Monte Carlo method to alleviate this kind of compound complexity. I believe some work, some existing works that apply this multi-level and multi-index method in the inference context here. And the most recent and related one is the paper that's published last year called the method called the multi-index sequential Monte Carlo ratio estimator. And the method that I'm going to introduce here is just a randomized version of it. And because we're using the random setting of, on this method, we like solve many drawbacks of this non-randomized method. The two most uh, benefit of that is we can achieve the pretty good canonical complexity automatically. And also the assumption needed is dimension independent. And the other one is that this randomized method is unbiased estimator, not like the non-randomized method. And you, you may find that this uh, the algorithm name is really long. It's called a randomized multi-index sequential Monte Carlo ratio estimator. But don't worry about it. It just has three main components: the randomized multi-index method, the sequential sem sequential Monte Carlo sampler, and the ratio estimator. And we will like explain these three components gradually through this talk. I don't think that everyone is familiar with multi-level and multi-index, so I will just briefly introduce about it in a 2D dimensional grid case, for example. Assume that we can have a sequence of approximates um, at some grid points with different grid levels in different dimension. Here, I represent the L and Q as the grid levels in different, in two dimensions. So, uh, we we assume that when the L and Q is equal to zero, which means that we are at the corest grid level. So it will give you the less, the least accuracy approximates of the quantity of interest. And if you set the L and Q to be the capital L, that is the finest grid level, and you can guess the most accuracy approximate of the uh, quantity of interest. One way to like relate is this grid level with the real grid mesh or the how they present how how accuracy the approximate could give is by we can set this L to be related to the step size of these grid points. That means that we can like set a sequence of equally spaced uh, grid points and we let the set size set uh, step size to be two to the minus L. So as you can see, as the L become larger and larger, step size will be smaller and smaller. So the more grid spring will be considered when approximating the uh, approximate of the quantity of interest. So that is the reason why the approximate become more and more accuracy as the level goes up. For the multi-level Monte Carlo estimator, we consider the grid level L and Q at the two dimension to be the same. That means that L will always equal to Q, and when you change the grid level in two dimensions, it will change as together. So for the multi-level Monte Carlo estimator, with some of those difference between two consecutive approximates, in the 2D case, that is, we only consider the diagonal two approximates. And for the multi-index Monte Carlo method, it can allow us to L and Q the grid level in two dimensions to vary uh, independently. So that means when we sum up those terms, this, each terms will have the difference of difference of, among these four consecutive approximates in the 2D case. And uh, if you like increase the dimension, like the 3D case, when we're computing the difference of difference, since there are three dimensions can vary differently. So each term will evolving like eight, eight consecutive approximates. 
we've probably like introduced what is the multi level and the multi index monoclonal method. And now I'm going to talk about how do we like analysis how well this monoclonal method uh, converges. How do we compare those advanced monoclonal methods? We can use the mean square error of the estimator between the Bayesian estimation ground truths uh, with respect to the total cost. So the convergence rate will be the rate related to mean square error and the cost. And here, in our case, the mean square error com com uh, has three components. The first is the bias introduced by the discretization in the model or the parameter. The second one is the statistical bias. And the third one is about the variance, or the variance of the estimator. First, uh, we talk about the statistical bias. The statistical bias is the bias will also be introduced even when we consider the infinite dimension. Like the bias will be introduced if you're using different sampler. Uh, for example, if we use using the MCMC sampler to samples from the posterior distributions, the MCMC sampler will give you the bias of the target distribution. However, if you use the SMC samplers, those st uh, statistical bias will just whip out because the SMC sampler will give you the unbiased estimator to the target distribution. The discretization bias, as we said before, it's introduced by the discretization in model and parameter. And that is the reason why it's caused the naive monocolor method have the compound complexity. Here we give out the convergence rate for the naive monocolor method. Also, we call it the single level here. Since for naive monocolor method, we don't have different approximate. We have just one approximate as the finest one, finest grid set. So as the dimension D goes high, that means that the convergence rate given here about R, the R will become larger and larger. So the convergence rate will be much lower. So as dimension goes high, those convergence rates will be much more flattened up. And the benefits of the multi-level and multi-index method is that uh, those convergence rates will always achieve the minus one under some suitable assumptions. This is a uh, pretty good. The reason why we can give this pretty good canonical complexity is for the construction of that. Because we sum up the difference between those consecutive approximates. And because of this construction, although we have the same discretization bias here, but when we compute the variance here with the same total uh, computational cost, the variance of the multi-level and multi-index will be decreased. And this reduction in the variance is uh, is by with only selecting a fewer samples as the finer grade and take the most of the samples at the coarser grade. So that, in other words, if you have the same variance, the cost of our estimator will be decreased. But there also has some drawbacks for the, the multi-level and the multi-index case. That means that is that first thing is that there's discretization bias. So when we do it in experiments, we need to tune in this bias term in order to guess the like the uh the capital oil, the finest grades we want, and we need to use it to determine how many samples we need for each grade level. Also, another drawbacks will be for some cases, the multi-level and multi-index assumption needed to achieve the kind of complexity will depend on the dimension. The randomized version of the multi-level and multi-index we introduced here is, is, is not selecting, it's not like setting a index set in advance, like selecting a pretty good L in advance, like the non non-randomized method, we randomly select those grade level L and Q from a probability distribution. And because of this construction, we will found that the discretization bias of the randomized method just disappeared. So which means that in the mean square error, we only have the variance term. So it's actually the case for the uh, naive monocolor method in the finite dimension. In the finite dimension, the monocolor methods always have the kind of complex because there's no bias. And the randomized methods can have the same situation. 
even we consider the posterior distribution in the approximate version. So it's pretty good. We don't have, need to tune in anything about the bias. And because there's no bias term anymore, we can achieve the dimension independent canonical complexity automatically. The only drawbacks of the randomized method theoretically is that when we use selecting, like when we use setting the probability distribution, P, uh, you need some more restricted assumptions. But this kind of assumption is not related to a dimension. Uh, next, I'm going to like uh, talk about how we use the SMC sampler when we consider the melting level and the melt index method in the Bayesian inference problem. Since when you're using the SMC sampler normally on the target distribution, the target distribution should just be a single distribution. However, when you apply the melt level or the melt index, instead of a single distribution, you will consider a coupling distribution that coupling all the probability measures corresponding to those intermediate melt indices when involving computing the difference of difference. Uh, that for the 2D case, if you consider the melt level case, you are coupling the distribution uh, probability measures between the distribution at grade level LL and L minus one, L minus one. So in multi-level case, in, in multi-level in the 2D case, you are coupling two intermediate distributions. And if you consider the melting index estimator in the 2D case, you will, you will coupling four different probability measures. So we call this coupling distribution to be the exact coupling. However, you can imagine when you do it in practical, those exact coupling is hard to gain since we don't have the normalized post distributions of that. We don't. We just have the unnormalized version of it. So an uh, an alternative, a successful strategy is being applied here is called the approximate coupling. And we use we can use the maximum coupling to compute the likelihood um, at each indexes, and times the exact coupling of the prior of the indexes. Since the prior we choose is normally just like Gaussian case or the uniform distribution, and those kind of posterior distribution can be easily calculated the exact coupling of that. Then we can apply the SMC sampler on this uh, coupling distribution. The SMC sampler gives an estimation of the target coupling distribution by approximating a sequence of filter distributions, the H, and using iteratively important sampling, resemble steps, and MCMC move through this filter distribution. In each temporary step, we will estimate we will use the important sampling to samples from this filtering distributions. And using the MCMC move, uh, that is the, the any MCM suitable MCMC kernel you can choose here, to move from one filtering state to another one. So that MCMC helps we move from one filtering distribution to another. And the most uh, the first version of the SFC sampler just combining the important sampling with the MCMC move. So because of the degenerated of those MCMC and the important sampling, so as dimension goes high, this simple, the first version of the SMC sampler is not efficient and will be degenerated as dimension goes high. So people later introduced the resample steps to the SMC sampler to help to help alleviate the degeneration of the, uh, the, the initial version one. The resampling steps uh, is to like take out the samples with large weight and replicate it. And it discard the samples with uh, smaller weight. So that helps with diversity of the samples in the SMC sampler in different filter distribution. We have a talk about how we use the SMC sampler in the context of the multi level and multi index case and combine the sampler with those advanced Monte Carlo method you choose. You then can get the method that can apply it on the Bayesian inverse problem. 
However, there's still one remaining component that I haven't talked about is why we want to use the ratio estimator. Well, we just summarizing all the normalized uh, estimator for each difference or difference together. And that's all why we want to use another one. There are two estimators that could be considered here. The first one is the estimator that people normally use is just as I said, we, norm we sum up all the normalized estimator for the difference of difference. And another one is the ratio estimator is that we don't sum up the normalized estimator. We sum up the unnormalized estimator together and then we normalize this sum summation at the very end. Actually, in the limiting form, these two estimators are, are the same and they are two cons consistent estimator. However, when you do the uh, theoretical convergence proof for the randomized or the non-randomized multi-index method, you have just found that only the ratio estimator could give us the pretty good convergence rate of it. That is because when we using this uh, self normalized increment estimator, it is really hard to deal with the off-diagonal terms. Uh, that is the term that L is, and Q doesn't equal to each other in the mean square error estimate arising from the bias term for the difference of difference. Now combining these three components, we can finally get our RMI SMC ratio estimator. This is defined in the equation seven. And the, the unnormalized estimator in the nominator and denominator of our estimator, that is the phi to the R MIS is uh, free from the discreditation bias. And that is very crucial things when we compute the convergence rate of this, of our randomized ratio estimator, this is could be bounded by the unnormalized estimator. So since this normalized, unnormalized estimators free from discretization, it has a pretty good variance decay. So we can guarantee that we have a pretty good convergence decay, convergence rate for the our ratio estimator. We also give out the non-randomized method, the estimator for the non-randomized method. And now you can see that the estimator in the norm, uh, now normalized, unnormalized estimator in the nominator and denominator is no longer unbiased because you only select those index from a suitable index and not from the whole space. So now we can see what is the convergence theory for this method under some realistic assumptions that we're gonna talk about in details later in comparison between the randomized and non-randomized method in a spe special case. For if you can choose a suitable probability distribution P out of space, then it guarantees that your ratio estimator can have the pretty good canonical rate. And the condition that needed to choose the proper probability is uh, has two conditions. The first one is that we need the probability variance to be bounded. The V are we alpha given here is the variance of the estimations of the difference of difference. And the second one is that we need the probability cost to be also be bounded. The C alpha here is the cost to estimating the difference of difference. However, these two conditions is, is not a trivial condition, it's not quite easily to be fulfilled in every problem. But it's worth noting that even though this uh, condition is not um, satisfied and you cannot choose this most uh, proper probability P to guarantee the canonical rate, you still can apply this randomized method, but will suffer from a decrease of canonical rate. The reason why we still want to apply this randomized method, even though we, we know that we probably don't have the canonical rate for some problem is because this randomized method is really easy to apply since there's no bias in it, which means that you don't need to tune in anything and you don't need to set up the index set in advance. Especially in the higher dimensional case, it will be a really tricky one to find the 
the index that we want. And next, I'm going to talk about like the detailed comparison between the non-randomized method and the randomized method in a 2D case. The, these two figures shows the different indexes that we chose for different methods. First, we look at the figure A. This is two popular and well-used index set that can be used in the non-randomized method in 2D case the tensor product index set and the total degree index set. In the tensor product index set, we take all the points from the grid mesh. And for the total degree index set, we only take the lower triangular one. That means to compare with the tensor product index set, the total degree index set will abandon the grid point that has the most computational cost. And for the randomized method, we don't need to choose those indices in advance. So here I just show the probability for choosing each indices in the 2D case. As the color uh, goes more lighter, that means the probability of choosing these indices become less likely. And one popular way to choose those probability to satisfy this two equation normally could be a following a geometric distributions. And the factors, the prime, the probabilities of these geometry distributions normally will be related to the here I say is about the beta plus gamma. And the beta is about the rate of how the variance decay for each difference of difference. And the gamma is how the cost increases of the C alpha. And here in the this following table, it shows the constraint that is required to achieve the kinetic complexity for the randomized and non-randomized method. There are two conditions that may need it. The first one is about the summation uh, about the ratio related to the cost and the bias term. And the second one is about the really um, unwilling constraint about we need to tune in the bias term. It's worth noting that for the first condition, as the capital D, that is the dimension of the problem, it goes high, those ratio, the summation of the ratio is really easy to larger than two. That means that this kind of condition is dependent on the dimension of D for some problem. For the randomized method, we don't have the bias anymore, so we don't need any condition that's related to the bias. So both of these conditions are not needed. That is pretty good. That is also the reason why we call it dimension independent kind of complexity, since it don't need the constraint that related to the dimension. Quick question, uh, if I may. Yeah. Uh, do you have any conditions regarding uh variances or something like that because I mean you want you remove the bias but uh, you want the va variance of the estimator to be finite don't you get any conditions from there yeah uh for the virus you need to guarantee that the decay of the virus is faster than the increase of the cost so there's a condition between the decay of the virus and the cost which but I mean is it possible to satisfy this always um it will normally be satisfied, but you need to verify that. It's not guaranteed that it will satisfy for all the problems. But actually, it's not. I think it is only satisfied when you're in the canonical case, in the best case. Otherwise, you cannot. Yeah. So, which means this is not possible in general. I mean, only in the very, in the very case where the 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 bias method already achieved uh, achieved also the the best complexity right so you you remove the bias but i mean uh, the other one also achieves uh, the best complexity anyways okay we can discuss this at the end but but i mean the variance is also important the discussion on the bias does cannot go alone otherwise you you give a misleading picture yeah yeah Thank yeah I, I yeah 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 i i see what you mean the only thing uh, the only reason that i like delay these conditions here. I know this condition is really, really important, but I think I, I'm i thinking just comparison between like the non-randomized and the randomized method. Here, so I just listed the 
conditions that is different for these two methods. Since the various method, uh, the various conditions is needed in both methods. So I didn't uh, show the conditions here, but yeah, that that condition is really important. Yeah. Uh, so uh, for the non-randomized method, uh, it's a bit tricky since you need to choose the proper indexes to to avoid this first condition. This first condition is dimension independent and we don't want it. So the only way to abandon this uh, condition is to choosing the proper index set. In a 2D case, it means that we need to choose the total degree index set. However, uh, no matter how well you choose the, the index set, you're still facing the tuning things when you're doing the experiment. Also, there's one thing that is worth uh, to see that is um, in the 2D case, the total degree index set is the proper index set when you're applying the non-randomized method. And compare it to the non-randomized populated indices, you will find that it is really alike, which suggests us that our randomized method will always choose the proper index set. Now we're going to see how these problems uh, perform in the different problems. First, we look at uh, some elliptic partial differential equations. It is established here, and we take the prior to be the uniform distributions, and we generate the observations like, like the structure in the inverse problem. First, we look at the 1D, 1D case, and I've also plotted the single level Moncalo method here for comparison. You have found that in the 1D case, since there are bias term here, the single level already dropped from them. The convergence rate of the single level Moncalo method already dropped from minus one to minus four or five. And if you consider the 2D case, although I didn't plot the, the convergence rate for the single level, but theoretically the convergence rate will drop from minus four over five to minus two over three. So as the dimension goes higher, this convergence rate will be much lower and lower. For the PD problem, the randomized method and the ra non-randomized method with different indexes all shows the pretty good convergence rate out. And we don't see a difference here. The reason why we think about it is uh, the PD problem is well-defined and the uh, condition that needed are all that satisfied to achieve the canonical rate. Next, we're going to see the difference in the two 2D statistical models, the log Gaussian Cox process model and the log Gaussian process model. In these models, we only can define the likelihood and the prior in the finite approximation. We don't, we cannot compute the, the infinite version of it. We don't have it. First, we look at the log Gaussian Cox model. And the first thing you notice is that if we don't choose those indexes properly in the non-randomized methods, you will suffer from a sub kind of convergence rate. As seen, the tensor product set is showing in the blue line. And if you choose those indexes in the uh, non-randomized method properly, you will get a pretty good canonical complexity results as the randomized method. However, we uh, there's potential dropback of the randomized method that is unexpected and unseen from the theoretical result is that the gap between the randomized method, there's a constant gap between the randomized method and randomized method. And the reason why we think of there's a gap because when we randomly select those indices from a probability distributions, there may be some gaps here. And as we did, we will compute the sum up the difference of difference when we do the multi index case. And if you take the expectation over the summation and spread this summation out, you will find that most of these intermediate approximate will all be canceled out. So only the approximate with the highest with the highest accuracy will be remain. Uh, but if you have some gaps, 
among those indices, some of those terms cannot be canceled. So when you computing the variance of this estimator, there will be extra term here. So the constant will be a little bit larger because of this extra term. But we don't think that is a pretty huge problem since the gap here is not that large. And as soon as we can apply the randomized method easily on every problem and it can guarantee have to have the canonical complexity rate, it's worth for us to do that. Uh, for the log Gaussian process model, we can have we can see a similar result as the LGC model. That is, if the non-randomized method don't have the proper index set, we will suffer from a subconical rate. And there are also a gap between the randomized and non-randomized method. However, for the LGP model, this kind of this model is much more sensitive to the factors in it, the parameter that's setting in it, than the LGC model. So when you estimating and tuning the bias term, it's much harder in the LGP model. So it's much harder for us to apply our non-randomized method in the LGP than the LGC. But for the randomized method, it was it will be the same since we don't need to tune in the bias term. And we we thinking of uh that is all the experience we have. And we actually thinking about applying our randomized method in a high dimensional case, since the most highest dimension we test now is just 2D is not high enough and the data size is not large enough. We really think that the multi-level, those advanced multi color method could take the most advantages of them when you apply on the large data side or high dimensional case. So that is our next steps of our project. And thank you so much for listening. That's all. And I put our papers here in case you want to like read more about details about it. Thanks.